At the end of World War I, a new type of warship emerged in the form of an aircraft carrier, and the Royal Navy, United States Navy, and Imperial Japanese Navy would begin developing vessels on this type. Of these nations, Japan was the only one that would construct an aircraft carrier from scratch, whereas the Royal Navy and United States Navy both converted vessels into aircraft carriers. On the 6th of February, 1922, Britain, the United States, Japan, France, and Italy would sign the Five Power Treaty, or the Washington Naval Treaty, which began to place restrictions on what a modern navy could be. Most attention when making the treaty went into battleships and battlecruisers, since these were considered the best type of vessel a navy could operate at the time. The five navies would also attempt to apply a definition to the aircraft carrier for the first time, and this was done in Article 20, Part 4, where aircraft carriers were considered to be 10,000 ton standard displacement or greater with the ability of landing and launching aircraft. Aircraft carriers that began construction or conversion prior to the signing of the treaty were all considered experimental vessels and did not have to be included in the total tonnage allocated towards each navy, which for Japan was 81,000 tons standard. New aircraft carrier builds were limited to a maximum of 27,000 tons standard displacement, while conversions of two under construction capital ship hulls were allowed to reach 33,000 tons standard displacement. By the end of the 1920s, Japan had three aircraft carriers. The 7,500 ton Hosho was experimental by treaty terms. The two converted vessels, Akagi and Kaga, ended up being closer to 27,000 tons apiece, and thus Japan had 27,000 tons left to play with. This was actually terrible news for the Japanese. The Royal Navy had four aircraft carriers that were not counted by the treaty, as they were all considered experimental, and the United States had one. And the United States had completed two conversions of its own, the Lexington and Saratoga, which actually went over the displacement set by the treaty, at 37,000 tons standard displacement each, giving the United States 75,000 tons of aircraft carrier, yet they were still left with 60,000 tons to play with in their total allocations. Having 27,000 tons to construct one aircraft carrier was horrendous for the Japanese, and they recognized it. So, they decided to play with the treaty's own wording, stating that an aircraft carrier was 10,000 tons or greater standard displacement. They decided, why not mass-produce a bunch of vessels that still launched and landed aircraft, but were under 10,000 tons? This would allow the Japanese to construct aircraft carriers legally, but they wouldn't be counted as aircraft carriers in their total tonnage. As a result of this loophole, the Naval General Staff ordered an aircraft carrier to be designed of roughly 8,000 tons standard displacement, so they had about 2,000 tons to play with if necessary, and it would also have improved defensive qualities when compared to the preceding aircraft carriers, along with a similar operational speed. Since the Naval General Staff understood the constrictions that would be placed on the design because of the vessel's size, they ordered that the vessel initially only be capable of carrying 25 to 30 aircraft. As had been done with Hosho in the late 1910s, the Japanese would base the whole design off of an already existing warship, and in this case, it was the most recent generation of cruisers in the form of the Furutaka and Aoba classes. As was done going from Kuma to Hosho, the Japanese would alter the hull dimensions from Furutaka to the new aircraft carrier. Furutaka's hull was 607 feet long, where the new aircraft carrier would be 590 feet long, and the beam of Furutaka was 54 feet, whereas the beam for the new aircraft carrier would be 62 feet. The Japanese would also slightly redesign the bow in order to increase aero and hydrodynamics. Once the hull design was completed, the designers would then add a single, continuous hangar on top of the hull, which would support the flight deck. The flight deck itself would be set back from the bow about 75 feet, and it would be roughly evened out with the stern. As could be seen on Hosho Akagi and Kaga, the bridge was placed underneath the forward edge of the flight deck. The ship's propulsion system would consist of six Campon water tube boilers that were oil-fed, feeding steam to two geared steam turbines, which produced 65,000 shaft horsepower. 
This would give the vessel a top speed of 29 knots and an operational range of 10,000 nautical miles at 14 knots. A new funnel design was also tested for this vessel. It consisted of one large and one small funnel sticking out the starboard side of the hangar, and these did not really curve up or down. They effectively stuck straight out. Up to this point in the designing phase, the designers had been fulfilling the requirements set forward by the Naval General Staff. But now we enter the category of defensive qualities, where the designers had no option but to fail. Due to the constrictive size of the ship, the Japanese had no option of installing any form of armor, and so it would only receive a 15mm splinter deck over the machinery spaces. The ship's anti-aircraft armament was a significant improvement over its predecessors, but this was partially due to the introduction of a new weapon in the form of the Type 89 12.7cm dual-purpose guns, which the new carrier would receive six twin mounts. It would also receive 12 13mm machine guns in twin mounts as well. The design was submitted and approved, which resulted in the kill being laid down on the 26th of November, 1929, at the Mitsubishi Yard in Yokohama. By the time the ship's keel was laid down, the Japanese had Hosho in service for roughly six years, while Akagi and Kaga were both in service for roughly a year. During this time frame, all three aircraft carriers would participate in various exercises, and this would show the Japanese how the aircraft carriers should operate in the event of a war, and this meant that they required a change to the design. It was realized that in order for air groups to participate in effective coordinated attacks, they needed to be of respectable sizes, and 28 aircraft total did not meet this requirement, so the Naval General Staff ordered the vessel's complement to be doubled. Much design work had been placed into the carrier for its initial design, and construction had already begun with many pieces having been pre-manufactured. So the designers couldn't really start from scratch, and they had to work with what was already underway. The solution was an obvious one and one they had already done two times over. They would add an additional hangar deck on top of the already existing one, as could be seen on Akagi and Kaga. The amount of features that had to be relocated as a result of the addition of a second hangar deck was extreme. Some examples included the funnel uptakes, the anti-aircraft guns, the bridge, and of course, the flight deck. New piping, electrical wires, and fire control systems would have to be installed, along with new aviation handling spaces, such as bomb and torpedo storage, along with fuel access. The ship's elevator system would also have to be reworked in order to extend an additional deck. These alterations would allow the ship to carry a maximum of 48 aircraft. However, it did annihilate the stability as the ship was now top-heavy, so the Japanese would add the Sperry Gyro Stabilizer. The Gyro Stabilizer was effectively a clunky machine that would detect when the ship began to pitch or roll, and it would counteract the motion of the ship's hull. While this machine would ensure that the aircraft carrier would never capsize, it was expensive to construct, install, and it was quite difficult to maintain. With the alterations having been concluded and working plans having been drawn up, they were handed off to the shipyard, and construction would continue as normal until the 2nd of April, 1931, when the ship was launched, and it would be completed and commissioned on the 9th of May, 1933, as the IJN Ryuzhou. When the Japanese set out on this project, they intended to mass-produce Ryuzhou's design, since it didn't have to be counted in the tonnage allocated towards Japan. However, on the 22nd of April, 1930, Japan would sign the London Naval Treaty with the other four naval powers, which redefined the aircraft carrier in Chapter 2, Part 4, as a warship irrespective of its displacement that was designed for the specific and exclusive purpose of carrying aircraft and so constructed that aircraft can be launched therefrom and landed thereon. This meant that by the time Ryuzhou was completed, the loophole that it was exploiting was gone, and the ship had to be put in the 81,000 ton tonnage along with Hosho, so Japan went from 54,000 tons of aircraft carriers to just shy of 70,000 tons, leaving them with 12,000 tons to play with. The Japanese took notice of the issues between Hosho and Ryuzho because of their constrictive sizes, and so Japan would never again design a light aircraft carrier from scratch. 
All future aircraft carriers under 10,000 tons to operate under the Japanese flag would be wartime conversions. As a result of this decision, the Japanese Navy would not incorporate aircraft carriers of this size for roughly the next decade. However, this did not mean that Ryuzho itself didn't need attention given to it during that decade, as the ship had more problems than the Japanese were anticipating. However, that is a story for another day. So, if you have learned something new in this video, why not leave a like and a comment down below, and have a wonderful day.